Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back to our cardiac imaging uh, uh, lecture series. Today, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paco Bravo that will be talking, he will be talking about role of advanced cardiac imaging in the evaluation and management of cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, Dr. Bravo is originally from Colombia. He's currently at Penn in Philadelphia, where he's the director of nuclear cardiology. He has a very extensive training in cardiac imaging, probably some of the most extensive I've seen. He trained in some of the top centers, including John Hopkins, University of Washington in Seattle, and at the great program at, at Brigham. In, in Boston with Marcelo Di Carli. So uh, it's a great pleasure to, to have you here today. I think that your talk is very important for, for everyone, uh, imagers and heart failure attendings as well. So welcome. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the uh, kind introduction. So um, I'm really uh, thrilled to be invited to talk about um, uh, advanced imaging in the evaluation and management of, of uh, patients with suspected, I'm gonna say suspected because very few of them have pathology proven that they have cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, and so I, I, I'm in, in, in radiology, but I'm also a cardiologist. Um, and so um, I, I read um, cardiac MRI as well. Um, and, and obviously um, cardiac path. So, so I actually, um, I'm involved in, 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 in the evaluation of these patients from both uh, modality perspectives. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you're gonna enjoy um, this talk and, and at the end, um, hopefully we're gonna have time to do some, some discussion. So this is the outline of um, today's presentation. We're gonna, uh, briefly talk about uh, the background of uh, sarcoidosis and cardiac sarcoidosis. Then we're gonna focus on the diagnosis, uh, risk of stratification, and the role of imaging in um, directing therapy in these patients. So sarcoidosis, as we all know, is a multisystemic uh, granulomatous uh, inflammatory condition of uh, unknown etiology or cure and, um, and historically, we know that um, um, African Americans have a higher incidence of sarcoidosis. However, the incidence of cardiac sarcoidosis is unknown. Um, whether African Americans also have more, more uh, uh, or a higher incidence of, of, of cardiac involvement or not. Um, and in fact, um, I don't have the data, but um, we usually see more uh, Caucasians with, with cardiac involvement which could be also a referring bias or that African-Americans are not diagnosed. That remains to be uh, um, proven. And so um, historically, um, looking at this uh, data from, from, the, from between 1988 to 2007, uh, the, the mortality rate of uh, African-Americans um, with cardiac sarcoidosis actually tended to go up uh, over 10 years, but not so much for Caucasians. And this was seen you know, in, in both males and, and females. Uh, it was also interesting uh, that um, uh, patients with uh, sarcoidosis, with a diagnosis of sarcoidosis, um, had, um, um, they tended to actually die at an earlier age than, than patients uh, who didn't have sarcoidosis. And this was more pronounced in, in African-Americans. And among patients who died with a diagnosis of sarcoidosis, cardiac etiology was considered to be the contributing factor in 25% of all uh, sarco-related deaths, implying that uh, about 25% uh, uh, were related to cardiac sarcoidosis. Very interestingly, um, when you actually compare sarcoidosis versus non-sarcoidosis cohorts, um, um, patients uh, with sarcoidosis uh, die at a younger age from cardiac causes, both in, in Blacks and in Caucasians. So it seems like uh, cardiac sarcoidosis tends to affect uh, younger individuals, or at least in a more severe way than in older individuals. From a histopathology um, perspective, um, um, when you actually look at the explant appearance of sarcoid lesions, uh, you will see that they, they look like a pale, uh, very well-defined lesions. Uh, these are two, sub, two subjects who had explanted hearts 
And uh, subject A, uh, when you actually look at under the microscope, uh, what you see is that these lesions are actually filled with a scar and granulomas. And on, on, on further evaluation, these uh, granulomas contain histiocytes and lymphocytes. However, subject A had a very similar appearance of the, of the sarcoid lesions, but on histology, it was only scar. There was no evidence of uh, um, granulomas. And this patient, in fact, uh, um, before explantation had um, uh, endomyocardial biopsy that actually shows some granulomas. So basically showing that in, 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 in this condition, the granulomas can actually be, become inactive and go away. Uh, and then you will only see a scar in, in some in certain situations. So uh, the absence of granulomas uh, doesn't imply that the patient did not have sarcoidosis. Um, also, uh, when people have actually examined the histology of um, patients who died as a result or, or died with the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, I should say, uh, and they, when they actually look at the histology, three types of uh, histologic stages or patterns have been identified. Um, the first one uh, is, is actually the least common and is when you only see um, lymphocytic infiltration and there's no scar. This is actually the least common. Um, then the one that is the most commonly seen is when you have uh, well-defined granulomas with a scar. So that's actually the most common. And the third uh, pattern is when uh, there's only uh, replacement fibrosis without granulomas. Those are the main uh, uh, histologic findings. And, and, and this has uh, clinical implications from, from a diagnosis and imaging perspective, because if you think about it, if you only uh, have uh, inflammatory cells without a scar, your MRI, MRI is gonna be negative, at least uh, if you're using LG as, as your marker of, of reference. Whereas if you're using um, uh, molecular imaging to image inflammatory cells, then, then you're gonna have a mismatch. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this group will, is gonna have concordant imaging findings with uh, um, inflammation on, on, on functional imaging and the scar uh, on MRI, uh, scar detection. Whereas in this situation, when you only have replacement fibrosis, um, your functional imaging is going, to, is going to be negative, but you're going to still see, obviously, um, a scar formation on, on MRI or, or uh, as a scar doesn't go away. So um, the prevalence of cardiac involvement, um, I, I think uh, this is, is now accepted that it's anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of patients with uh, systemic sarcoidosis based on autopsy studies, but also based on um, uh, MRI series, um, and, and very importantly, the most common cause of death among patients with cardiac sarcoidosis is arrhythmic uh, ventricular-related uh, uh, deaths, so VT or VF, uh, with prog uh, heart failure, progression to heart failure as the second leading cause of death. What is very important uh, is that uh, before the advent of advanced imaging, the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis was only known in third in a third uh, of, of these patients, uh, but I think that has changed as we have um, started doing more and more uh, imaging. So, the role of uh, uh, of imaging uh, in cardiac sarcoidosis is several fold. The first step is to establish the diagnosis. Then, uh, once you identify someone with likely sarcoidosis, you have to uh, do risk of stratification because you, you, you want to know who's at higher risk of sudden death. Uh, then you need to establish whether the patient has evidence of inflammation. And if it started on treatment, then you're going to use imaging for guiding therapy. So uh, the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, the gold standard is uh, histology, cardiac um, biopsy. But only a small fraction of patients with, with suspected cardiac sarcoidosis end up um, having cardiac biopsies. And, 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 and we know that um, uh, the diagnosis, um, cardiac biopsy is highly specific. So if you actually find evidence of uh, granulomatous myocarditis on histology, 
Uh, so uh, you can establish the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, but the sensitivity is, is poor because it's a condition that is, is patchy and can affect certain regions of the heart. And so if a negative biopsy doesn't exclude the, the possibility of the diagnosis. And so you, you, we really have to actually rely on, on clinical history and non-invasive assessment. Uh, and historically, uh, patients with cardiac sarcoidosis have been uh, evaluated with uh, ECG, uh, Holter monitoring echocardiography. In the past, Thalian and Gallian uh, were uh, nuclear medicine techniques uh, that were used. But now, uh, nowadays, for the last 10, 15 years, uh, FDG, uh, FDG PET and, and MRI with legal immune enhancement has actually become the standard of care for, for the evaluation of these patients. And so if you actually um, correlate the histology with the imaging findings, um, basically what we're doing with, with FDG um, is imaging activated inflammatory cells. So basically imaging activated histiocytes and lymphocytes. So that's what we're, we're actually imaging with, with PET. Whereas with MRI, uh, um, when we actually uh, uh, look at legadolin enhancement, we're actually imaging replacement fibrosis or scar uh, in these patients. Um, ECHO is uh, obviously the first um, imaging modality that we all use in the evaluation, in the initial evaluation of these patients, but it has poor sensitivity. So um, a normal ECHO doesn't mean anything, whereas the specificity is a little bit higher. This, I mean, this number is probably uh, overestimated, but um, there's some certain imaging findings on echocardiography that highly suggest the possibility of cardiac sarcoidosis, like thinning of the basal uh, inferior septum. And so now we, we all rely on, on, on MRI and, and FDG PET for the evaluation of these patients. And I, I would just say that the sensitivity and specificity of both modalities is pretty compatible. I don't think one is better than the other. Um, they, the, the sensitivity and specificity also depend on, on the stage uh, um, because uh, in early stages, PET is going to be more sensitive whereas in later stages, MRI is going to be more sensitive than, than PET for the evaluation of these patients. But in, the, in, in patients with granulomas and SCAR at the same time, so the, the, the sensitivity and specificity, specificity is pretty comparable, although there are some limitations for both techniques. And so uh, the diagnosis of uh, cardiac sarcoidosis, if you follow the guidelines, is, is based on... Uh, uh, expert consensus, okay? And so if you have the histologic, uh, if you have histologic evidence of granulomatous uh, myocarditis, um, then you establish the diagnosis. You don't need anything else. But like I said, most patients don't have cardiac biopsies and most cardiac biopsies, if performed, are negative. Then you have to rely on, on, on clinical and imaging criteria. And so, uh, um, According to the, the Heart Rhythm Society uh, cons consensus statement, uh, put together this um, guidelines, or it's not a guideline, but again, recommendations for the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And the first step is to establish uh, the, the diagnosis of sarcoidosis outside the heart. So uh, most patients with cardiac sarcoidosis have uh, extra cardiac involvement, most, most, most commonly pulmonary sarcoidosis. So you, you want to have uh, evidence of sarcoidosis outside the myocardium so that um, your imaging findings are more likely related to sarcoidosis. Uh, having said that, uh, isolated cardiac sarcoidosis can exist. And, 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 and so that's actually uh, possible. And then uh, this criteria will not detect those individuals. And so once you have extra cardiac sarcoidosis, then you, have, you, you need to uh, have uh, some of these uh, clinical um, criteria. So um, including unexplained LVF, uh, heart block, VT, and, uh, and FDG and LG um, in, in a pattern that is consistent with cardiac sarcoidosis. So if you, if you have that, then you, you can establish the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis with a relatively high degree of certainty. <laughs> So um, the protocols, there are several protocols to image patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, um, um, starting with a cardiac MRI. And, um, 
and also uh, doing um, PET imaging combined with myocardial perfusion, which can be done with a SPACT or PET perfusion, or you, some centers may have uh, hybrid PET MR systems, which would be ideal. But you can also always uh, you can always uh, fuse your PET and MRI images, even if they were uh, acquired in separate systems with, with some uh, specific software packages, as I'll show in a minute. So with MRI, um, what we imaging is is the extracellular volume in in the myocardium, and so if this extracellular volume is normal, there's not going to be uh, uh, enhancement or late gadolinium enhancement after gadolinium infiltrate injection. However, if you have uh, replacement fibrosis, then you're going to see enhancement. And, 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 the, and this is not specific to anything because uh, fibrosis can occur after, heart, after a myocardial infarction or after sarcoidosis infiltration or in multiple non-ischemic cardiomyopathy processes. So it's more, it's more important the pattern of, uh, and the location uh, to establish the diagnosis. Because when you actually compare um, LGE in, in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis with the explant, these are not the same patients, but, but, but the, the, the location of legadolin enhancement is very similar to what we see in explant hearts. And, and, and commonly um, uh, what we see is uh, subepicardial enhancement in the anterior septum and the inferior septum. Um, and, and usually the basal slices are more commonly involved than the apical slices. Also the septum is more commonly involved and the subepicardium is more commonly involved. But sarcoidosis can affect any wall segment. It can also uh, cause subendocardial enhancement. So, so, so basically um, there are typical and atypical patterns of LG, I would say. There's also a, an inverse relationship between uh, extent of uh, legadolinium enhancement and ejection fraction. The more LGE, the lower your LVF, and that actually applies to basically any, any cardiomyopathy. So as mentioned, there are um, different patterns. You can have subendocardial enhancement in sarcoidosis is, is atypical. Uh, so then it really depends on the clinical context. Uh, you can also see transmural enhancement or mid-wall. But the most typical patterns are uh, subepicardial enhancement, as mentioned, especially if involving the anterior septum and inferior septum. And, and, and what is important to, to know is that uh, LG um, doesn't, doesn't get better So in, in these patients. So for example, in this particular study, uh, patients were imaged uh, eight months later, and the, ex the extent and the appearance of LG was pretty much identical. So um, with uh, PET is different. Um, with PET, uh, we use FDG as the molecular tracer and FDG is basically radioactive glucose. And so one of the, the issues with, with FDG is that um, uh, FDG is not specific to inflammation. So what usually happens after FDG is injected is that the cells uh, take up uh, uh, the radio tracer, and then the radio tracer is actu actually phosphorylated similar to FDG, I'm, so I'm sorry, similar to, uh, to glucose. And once the, the FDG is phosphorylated, it gets trapped in the cells so that we can actually image. Um, and so the issue um, is that normal myocytes uh, also use glucose through the glucose transporter 4 in an insulin-dependent manner. And so what we have to do in order to image inflammation is to suppress the use of glucose by normal myocytes. And the way we do that is by uh, uh, may, may, uh, uh, inducing a metabolic switch in, in the myocardium so that normal myocytes uh, um, change their metabolism to uh, fatty acid and, and ketone body ketone body uh, um, uh, over glucose, okay? And so we do that uh, by um, uh, having patients follow a, a, a ketogenic diet for, for at least 24 hours, followed by fasting. On the other hand, uh, inflammatory cells, cancer cells, 
they actually use a different uh, glucose transporter mechanism of optic that is independent of, of the diet. And so, and that's why we actually can image inflammation and, and tumors independent of the metabolism of, of the normal cells. And so as mentioned, um, this is kind of, this is the, the uh, preparation that we, we recommend to patients to follow um, prior to, to imaging. And so does this uh, preparation work uh, in everyone? The answer is no. So we actually did a, a, a randomized um, study looking at the effect of the ketogenic diet in healthy volunteers, in 18 healthy volunteers. Um, and what we found is that um, uh, uh, the, the diet working in 78% of uh, healthy volunteers at 24 hours and 83% uh, is at 72 hours. So, so we saw a, a higher trend for better suppression rates with longer ketosis. And in fact, if you measure uh, the beta hydroxybutyrate levels, uh, you can see that uh, the beta hydroxybutyrate levels are significantly higher at 72 hours compared to uh, 24 hours. And what we found is that uh, checking the beta hydroxybutyrate levels could actually help uh, predict um, um, who, so who is going to suppress. Like in, in this example here, um, on top you see this individual um, with uh, complete suppression. Um, let me just actually use the pointer again. With complete suppression and the, and, and the beta hydroxybutyrate levels is 0.67, whereas all these uh, subject here, 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 and here, they fell to suppress and the beta hydroxybutyrate levels were significantly lower. Okay. And so there are different patterns of FDG optic in, in the healthy, in, 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 in the complete suppression. So um, some patients have diffuse optic throughout the myocardium, like in this case, some patients have optic only at the base of the heart. I call it uh, the basal ring uh, pattern. Some subjects have optic just limited to the lateral wall, and some subjects have heterogeneous optic or patchy optic in the left ventricle, like in this case. And so, so if you think about it, um, distinguishing these patterns of FDG optic from inflammation can be tricky. And that's why FDG sometimes is, is, uh, could um, lead to misdiagnosis because it's very hard to distinguish incomplete suppression from myocardial inflammation. And so this is actually under review right now in, in a journal, uh, but we hope that in the future, checking beta hydroxybutyrate levels may help um, predict who actually followed the diet and who didn't. And so for example, using a cutoff of 0.58, we found that um, beta hydroxybutyrate levels uh, correctly uh, classify individuals 92% uh, 90, of the times, which is very, very good. Um, so when you uh, image patients with sarcoidosis or suspected cardiosarcoidosis with FTG, uh, the recommendation is to actually include myocardial perfusion. Um, and so the role of myocardial perfusion is to basically detect a scar. Because as we know, a scar and inflammation coexist uh, very commonly. And so if you see a scar uh, with myocardial inflammation, then the likelihood that you're dealing with cardiosarcoidosis goes up. And so for, for myocardial perfusion imaging, you can use either a SPECT radio tracers or PET radio tracers. So in, fa in fact, most, most places actually combine FDG with uh, Technician 99 system EV. And so they basically, they, they, they start with Technician 99 system EV. Um, just you only need the rest scan. You don't need to do stress testing. And, and then you can use, you, you can do FDG right after Technician 99. You can do the other way because uh, the, 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 um, the activity of FDG will not allow to image uh, as packed after FDG has injected, but the other way is possible. So you can do technician first followed by FDG uh, because the windows are, are, are different and, and, and from the physics, you can actually do that. Um, 
On the other hand, um, if you have a, a, a rubidium generator like we do at Penn, so we, what we do is we, 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 we use rubidium, um, which has a very short half-life, and, and then um, we follow with FDG. So um, as mentioned, there are several different patterns of FDG. So you have uh, complete suppression, uh, you have failed, failed uh, metabolic switch, which you can basically establish when you see diffuse FDG optic. Um, then you have the pathologic uh, pattern when you have multifocal optic here and here, but then you have these equivocal patterns as we discussed. And so, um, if you if you actually use any FDG pattern to detect uh, sarcoidosis, then the sensitivity uh, is very high of FDG, but the specificity is quite low because uh, you're gonna detect everyone, but you're gonna misdiagnose a lot of people with with sarcoidosis. On the on the other hand, if you become a little bit more specific in the way you actually classify uh, uh, the patterns. Um, then you, you, you will lose some sensitivity, but you will gain some specificity. And so, for example, if you have extra cardiac inflammation with multifocal FDG, or if you have um, uh, perfusion abnormalities matching the location of FDG, then um, your, your specificity is very high for, to establish the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And so this is a representative case of a patient with sar sarcoidosis. Here you see that the perfusion is abnormal in the inferior septum, and that matches perfectly the location of FDG. So you have a hyperfusion metabolic mismatch. Uh, here you also see uh, locations uh, of inflammation without, without perfusion anomalies because um, the, the problem with perfusion is that um, a normal perfusion doesn't exclude uh, scar because the spatial resolution of um, this nuclear techniques is, is, is inferior than MRI. And so that's why uh, it's only helpful if you see the perfusion defect, but if you don't see the perfusion defect, can't really rule out the, 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 that there's underlying scar in, the, in, the, in, in sarcoidosis. Um, so this is, for example, a case of a patient with um, normal perfusion, and you see intense FDG optic limited to the lateral wall. And so as has been, as I've been mentioning, um, you can have patterns of, that are normal or in, of incomplete suppression that you have to be aware when you actually read these cases. So in other words, FDG optic doesn't equal inflammation. So you have to be very careful. On the other hand, if you actually um, um, do MRI and PET, and again, not necessarily on a hybrid system, but on, on different systems, you can actually um, fuse the images using some software. And for example, in this patient, you see that the location of FDG matches perfectly the location of legal linear enhancement. So when you actually fuse the images, you, you have a, a very uh, perfect match. And, and, and that's basically what you wanna see when you image these patients. You wanna see uh, some concordance of your MRI and your and your PET uh, findings. If you don't see a concordance, you have to be, so you have to question yourself if you're actually dealing with sarcoidosis or, uh, or a different condition. Um, and this was actually shown in a, in a, a study that was done actually, at, um, this is in New York, um, I think this is NYU or NYU Mount Sinai, I can't remember which one of those two. Um, but basically, they uh, the image patients with suspected cardiac sarcoidosis on a PET-MR system, and they found, uh, as mentioned, a really good uh, um, match between FDG and legal immune enhancement. But they actually found a few subjects that have FDG limited to the lateral wall without legal immune enhancement. And what they found is that those subjects have uh, had a, a different kinetics of FDG. So patients with inflammation, for example they have a stable activity over time, whereas uh, um, subjects with FDG optic limited to the lateral wall without legadolin enhancement on MRI, they had uh, ca different kinetics. The, the FDG activity actually increased over time, suggesting that that was metabolic activity from physiologic uh, uh, use of glucose. 
Okay, so just basically reemphasizing that that uh, certain patterns are not pathologic, but most likely physiologic due to incomplete suppression, and and that's always the that's the main problem of FDG. And so, for example, here you have two subjects. Uh, one subject number one has FDG uptake in the lateral wall. Subject number two has FDG uptake in the lateral wall as well. Subject number one, on the other hand, had an MRI with late adrenaline enhancement uh, in at the subepicardial aspect of the wall, matching the location of FDG. And so, so in this case, this FDG uptake is most likely due to inflammation, whereas subject number two had an MRI that was completely normal. And so in these cases, this FDG is most likely physiologic. On the other hand, um, there are situations where you can have FDG uptake only without um, MRI abnormalities as, 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 as mentioned in the past, if you have inflammation without a scar, your MRI is gonna be negative, okay? And so uh, that has actually been uh, described in the literature. And in fact, a, a small fraction of patients uh, may present with heart block and inflammation in the septum. And in those cases, MRI may or may not show a scar. And so, so um, in, my, in my experience, um, these are the patients that may actually have uh, a PET only finding, those who present with, with AV block um, um, and, and the MRI may or may not uh, show uh, co corresponding findings. So to summarize, uh, or to try to put everything together, um, um, patients um, who have histologic findings of um, inflammatory cells without a scar, uh, are gonna have uh, a normal MRI, the perfusion is gonna be unremarkable, and they're gonna have inflammation, okay? And the typical presentation is heart block. The next uh, histologic uh, stage uh, or finding is when you have granulomatous inflammation with a scar formation. And in these cases, LG, MRI is gonna be abnormal. Perfusion may be abnormal, but it could also be normal. And you're gonna have matching inflammation in, at the location of uh, LG. Uh, the typical, the, these patients can present with heart block, uh, LV systolic dysfunction or, or VT. And, and, and the last uh, uh, histologic uh, finding is a scar only with minimal or, non, or no granulomas. And so in these cases, MRI is gonna be abnormal, of course. Perfusion should be abnormal and you're not gonna see inflammation. And these patients usually present with sustained VT or uh, LV systolic dysfunction. All right, so once you establish the diagnosis of cardiosarcoidosis, the next step is to um, identify who is at higher risk of uh, events. And in this sense, MRI is likely the most important tool that you have uh, to us. Uh, to do risk stratification. And, and, and there are several studies in the literature and they all show the same. Uh, LGE is, is a very uh, important pronostic marker of events. So um, I'm just showing you here the, the first pa paper uh, that actually described these findings, but there are multiple papers nowadays. Uh, this is from Duke and they basically found that patients who had evidence of legatoline enhancement, they had uh, more events. Uh, this second paper here on the right hand, uh, on the right side of the slide, uh, was, is from um, uh, Chicago University of Chicago, and they they, they actually found uh, the same the same thing. Patients with LG had more events, and um, importantly, um, the extent of LG is also important. And so, in this particular study, for every one percent increase in, in in LG mass, uh, the hazard ratio of um, arrhythmic events and mortality increased by 8%. And this was actually in patients with preserved EF, so more, even more, more, more uh, impressive. So um, the question whether PET is, is also uh, um, uh, a predictor of events has been investigated in the past with some uh, conflicting results. Uh, and so, for example, in this paper from uh, the, the Brigands group, uh, Ron Blankstein actually looked at the predictive value of, 
FDG PET combined with perfusion. And what he, what he found is that uh, patients who have evidence of both a perfusion defect and FDG had uh, more events than patients who had normal perfusion um, and normal FDG. Uh, whether, whereas patients who had either abnormal perfusion or abnormal FDG had an intermediate risk. In a different study, um, we actually looked at uh, the, the, uh, the outcomes difference of uh, individuals who actually had both PET and MRI. And what we found is that uh, patients with legadolinium enhancement with or without uh, inflammation had similar event rates than patients who had normal MRI and PET, suggesting that uh, LGE is, is, is the main uh, driver of uh, risk prediction in, in these patients. And it makes sense because the SCAR is, is the main mediator of events. And this was actually uh, shown to be the case in this, in this meta-analysis that included almost 700 patients and what they found is that in the absence of legadolinium enhancement, uh, the, the possibility of ventricular arrhythmias is very, very, very low. Uh, so highlighting the, the, high, uh, the high negative predictive value of um, MRI. And as, as a result, uh, the uh, Heart Rhythm Society uh, does not recommend ICD implantation if you have preserved EF and no evidence of LGE on, on MRI. And so then you wonder, so how was the diagnosis of sarcoidosis established if, there, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the MRI is negative? Like I said, some cases may be, stopped, may be diagnosed based on PET. So if you have FDG uptake on PET, or if you have some degree of LBC solid dysfunction. Um, so that's another way you can establish the diagnosis with, with a negative MRI from, from an LGE status perspective. And so um, what is the role of uh, imaging for um, directing therapy? Because we already established the diagnosis. We already uh, established who is at higher risk and who, who should get an ICD uh, to prevent um, uh, sudden death. And then the, the next uh, question is who needs, to treat, who needs to be treated with um, immunosuppressants? Uh, and so in this sense, PET uh, is, is, is your modality of choice. So uh, FDG is a very sensitive marker of inflammation and it's also very sensitive to treatment response. And so uh, it has been extensively used in this, in this um, scenario um, to assess inflammation at baseline then to, uh, then, then to assess treatment response. So why do we treat these patients? So, um, so we think that treating these patients uh, will slow down the progression of um, LBC solid dysfunction. It, it may also improve AV conduction in patients who had a heart block and may improve uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Well, this is basically the, the current thoughts, um, but I don't think we have strong data uh, th that basically uh, that basically support those those assumptions. What about um, MRI to assess treatment uh, um, to assess inflammation? So, so T two weighted imaging, uh, including T two mapping, are uh, becoming very common in the evaluation of, of these patients. Um, in some centers, I have actually shown that T two may may represent uh, inflammation or may reflect inflammation. Um, but there's no really uh, good data to uh, prove that. Uh, and in fact, we did a study uh, when I was in Boston and we compared FDG versus T2 weighted imaging. And what we found is that uh, T2, at least in this study, was a, not a good marker uh, to assess inflammation. And so, so how do we use FDG uh, for treatment assessment? Um, so. Usually patients are started on, uh, on, on treatment based, based on the initial PET findings. So whenever a patient has cardiac sarcoidosis and they have cardiovascular uh, issues, e either because there's LVC solid dysfunction or arrhythmias, <laughs> these patients are treated, okay? With, uh, and the initial uh, treatment is 
prednisone and, and, and subsequently they, they actually um, continue on, on other steroid sparing agents, but at least at Penn, prednisone is the most common uh, uh, medicine to start uh, treatment. And so we are actually investigating um, some of the, um, um, some differences in, in, in treatment response. So we, we're interested in knowing uh, whether um, timing makes a difference. So whether you should re-image sooner or later, because there's really no consensus when you're supposed to re-image. Uh, there's also no consensus in what's the start dose of prednisone in these patients. And so in this particular study that I'm showing in this slide, uh, we included 83 patients with suspected cardiac sarcoidosis who had evidence of inflammation at the baseline scan and who were uh, started on treatment, okay? And, and, and most of them were started on prednisone. And so when we actually looked at the post-therapy scan, we noticed that 31% had a complete response, 40% had partial response, and 29% of them had no response to, to therapy. And so when we actually looked at uh, timing, um, we found that, um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the pointer again. Um, we found that um, timing didn't really change uh, uh, or influence the treatment response, meaning that if you actually image these patients um, between two and three months, it doesn't really make a difference compared to re-imaging these patients later on. And so this has uh, clinical implications because uh, uh, steroids are not very good medicines. They, people get side effects. So you really wanna re-image as soon as feasible. And, and basically our data suggests that you can actually uh, re-image these patients as early as two or three months. Um, and this is basically when you include everyone in our study and this on the right side is patients who were on prednisone only, which is most of them, 72. But the bottom line is that re-imaging these patients uh, at three months, two or three months uh, is no different than re-imaging at four or five months or even later. So what about uh, the start dose of prednisone? What is the effect of the start dose of prednisone on, 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 this, on, on, on treatment, in fact. So we actually looked at that, and, and basically we uh, compared patients who were studied on less than 30 milligrams of prednisone versus patients who were studied on 30 to 40 milligrams versus patients who were studied on 50 milligrams or greater. Um, and, and, and treatment response was defined as complete suppression or partial suppression. And what we found is that patients started on, on lower dose, they, they had lower suppression rates visually, although when you actually look at uh, the whole thing, is is not significant, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, they, they, it's, it's significant, but when you actually compare uh, these last two groups, the, the moderate dose and the high dose, the suppression rates are, are similar. So this suggests that um, patients um, will respond better if they're started on, on, on on 40 milligrams or greatest uh, prednisone than if they're studied on less than 30 milligrams. Uh, the treatment effect of the follow-up dose, so meaning the dose right before the second scan was not uh, shown to influence treatment response. So uh, it was more the, the start dose that was more important um, to predict uh, treatment response. And so what is the, the association between treatment response and clinical endpoints. And so uh, in this particular study, uh, they divided patients into uh, responders, meaning that there was uh, complete suppression of FDG versus non-responders, those who didn't have complete suppression. And they found that uh, responders had an, um, a significant increment in the ejection fraction before versus after treatment, whereas non-responders uh, did not uh, uh, have a response. But what you can see is that non-responders also tended to have a lower ejection fraction at baseline. And that is uh, clinically relevant because uh, uh, patients who have um, less 
legadolin enhancement uh, are more likely to respond to treatment. They, they have a higher ejection fraction um, um, after treatment, uh, whereas patients who had more than 20% LG extent, they actually had no response in treatment in terms of the ejection fraction. And so we actually uh, also looked at uh, the potential outcomes effect of um, uh, treatment uh, in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. So we uh, included 106 patients with this condition or suspected condition and followed these patients for uh, almost five years. And we found a lot of uh, cardiovascular events, including uh, 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 mortality, heart failure admissions, and sustained uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And, and what we found is that patients who had a uh, complete response on the second scan had similar events than patients who responded. So, so the, uh, the response on the second PET scan did not influence outcomes. But we did find in a multivariate uh, uh, regression analysis that patients who were studied on higher prednisone dose and, and those who had lower ejection fraction or less than 50% ejection fraction, they had more events than, than uh, um, uh, compared to patients who were not studying on prednisone. And so at least this data uh, suggests that uh, maybe studying these patients on a high dose of prednisone may not be beneficial. Uh, although there's, there are several confounders uh, with this data because patients who were studied on higher dose were sicker. They had lower ejection fraction and more arrhythmias to begin with. And so, so it's sometimes difficult to adjust. We try to adjust for that, but sometimes um, that's the, 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 the limitation of this retrospective uh, study designs. So in conclusions, um, when you have somebody with suspected cardiac MRI, I'm sorry, suspected cardiac sarcoidosis, uh, uh, the current recommendation is to start with MRI. If the MRI is negative and you don't have a strong clinical suspicion, you probably you can probably stop there. Uh, however, if you have clinical suspicion, you can you should probably go to PET, especially if the patient is presented with heart block. Um, if the MRI is inconclusive or positive, or if you have a negative MRI with a strong clinical suspicion, then you should go for PET. And if the PET is, is it shows uh, is con consistent with sarcoidosis, then you can establish the diagnosis and 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 treat patients uh, accordingly. So to summarize. Um, the role of um, uh, imaging is clearly uh, important in, in the evaluation and management of these patients. And to establish the diagnosis, uh, CMR and PET are equally important. Again, one is not better than the other one. They're just complementary. Uh, however, for risk stratification, MRI is clearly better than PET. But for assessing uh, disease activity or myocardial inflammation, PET is superior and, and, and so is uh, it is uh, to assess uh, therapy response. And with that, I'd like to conclude and, and I'll be more than happy to take any, any questions. Thank you so much. That was a, a great lecture. I think it's a, a pathology that, you know, it's for imagers is, we're all passionate about because it involves all these different imaging modalities. Right. But I love how you address how quality is important, in particular, if we want to identify these patients very early on. Uh, just as a start of a question, and then the rest of the questions, if you guys want to put in the QA, we'll go over them. Uh, have you looked at ECV and T1 mapping for early diagnosis of these patients? I see Dr. Garcia there. Um, um, so ECV, map, uh, ECV and T1 mapping. Um, I'm going to give you my opinion, OK? So I think T1 mapping and ECV are great tools for cardiomyopathies that have, that have a diffuse, a diffuse uh, histologic finding, okay? Uh, like amyloidosis or hemochromatosis, uh, things like that. Uh, T1 mapping are really um, great tools. For conditions that are patchy, I think the, the, the utility of T1 mapping and ECV is limited. That's a very good point. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for joining us. If you want to. Paco, that was a great presentation. Actually, I wanted to um, ask you two questions, if I don't mind. Um, 
The first one, um, years ago, we had a case um, that presented here, a patient with um, polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia, um, you know, detected on a monitor. She was having a lot of uh, uh, near syncopal events. Uh, did a um, first imaging, saw the always an echo, found a couple aneurysms mm -hmm. uh, on the echo. Um, uh, we did a um, MR, we saw a pattern uh, similar to the one that you represented here, um, uh, made myocardial, so epicardial, um, scarring in the area of the aneurysm, but also in other areas of the myocardium. Did a PET light up uh, uh, the same uh, way that the PET lights up in the sarcoid. She ended up having, uh, ha having the diagnosis of Chagas disease. Uh, uh, so the first question comes to that, how specific uh, are the patterns that you see uh, to be able to establish certainly the diagnosis? Number one. The second one is maybe more complicated. Patient with established pulmonary sarcoidosis, uh, cutaneous manifestation, completely negative MRI, uh, completely negative PET, but with uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. How certain are we that we don't have um, cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosis? What is the negative predictor value of the combination of both tests? Yes, no, <laughs> great question. So I would start saying that there are no pathognomonic findings, imaging findings um, 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 for cardiac sarcoidosis, even if you combine PET and MRI. I think there are uh, findings that are strongly suggestive of um, cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, and, you, in, and in fact, if we were in Argentina, we would have to always exclude uh, Chagas um, uh, uh, since the imaging findings are likely exactly the same uh, between Chagas and sarcoidosis. That, um, I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen en enough uh, uh, Chagas with MRI and PET, but, um, but I suspect that uh, there's a there's a significant overlap between the two conditions because you have inflammation and a scar. And, and that's basically what we're doing with PET. So PET, again, is a fairly non-specific marker. So is MRI because we're with MRI, we're imaging a scar and with PET, we're imaging inflammation. And then, then we have to basically um, uh, decide based on uh, the clinical uh, scenarios, whether this scar and inflammation is most likely related to sarcoidosis or a different inflammatory cardiomyopathy. Uh, the second question, it, similarly, um, I've seen patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis with normal MRI, with no LG, no inflammation, and an EF of 30%. Um, and now you're and basically this, the same question that you had, it, you have uh, VT and nothing else. So whether can we ascribe that to sarcoidosis, to cardiac sarcoidosis, um, or is it also possible that patients have two separate conditions going on, right? You have pulmonary sarcoidosis and you have VT from a different substrate or you have non lv systolic dysfunction because patient is diabetic and hypertensive and, you know, which is, it happens. So, so um, strictly speaking, if the MRI and PET are negative, I, I, I find it hard to believe that there's infiltration from sarcoidosis in the heart. Is it possible? I guess it's possible, but to me, it's very unlikely, and, and, and again, maybe we're, de we're dealing with two separate processes. Great, great. And, and I guess that given the, the, the high, um, I guess, false negative yield of biopsy, um, we're, we're kind of stuck there because, uh, you know, we don't have a, a, a very good gold standard. Uh, yeah, I, I, so, so for VT, I mean, so LG has, I mean, so these patients died of sudden death. Right, and so I, I think as, as as cardiologists and clinicians, uh, we want to make sure that these patients don't die of sudden death. Right, so risk stratification. So um, obviously, you can have VT without LG. So we know that, um, um, but you would probably have to treat that patient just like any other VT patient. Forget that they have sarcoidosis because th there's no LG. 
Very good. Uh, there are some questions coming that we can go through, and then if Yogita has a, a question as well, it says in, in, from Talal, he asks about the if the cases where CMR is not performed or, or not available, and you only have FDG. Uh, how to differentiate these uh, uh, physiological findings with the pathological apps uptake, and if you routinely recommend repeating the test, and I think you have some data from, from checking hydroxybutyrate, right? Uh, that, 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 is, that is, a, is research right now. So, so we're actually checking ketone levels, okay? So, um, so that's a great question, and, uh, I, and, 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 but, you know, I think nowadays MRI is more available than PET, I would think. So I, I would say that it would be, unless there's a contraindication for MRI imaging, that's a different story, right? Maybe the patient can't get an MRI, but I would really try to get an MRI uh, uh, again, unless there's a medical reason not to get an MRI. In those cases, uh, then you would have to do perfusion combined with FDG. And hopefully you're gonna see some, some perfusion defects matching the FDG optic. And if you don't, then it's really more, it, it, it becomes more like a, your experience basically. And, and whether you see multifocal FDG optic. Uh, when, in, my, in, my, in my case, um, if all I see is FDG optic limited to the lateral wall or the base of the heart, then you know I rec what we what we do is when we have uh, questions we do recommend repeating this the FDG but with a longer prep. So our current recommendation is to uh, 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 prep these patients after 24 hours on the ketogenic diet, and and so if you have any questions, uh, just repeat the scan. Recommend repeat the scan with a longer prep, three days. Uh, if people follow the ketogenic diet for three days, the ketosis is going to go up and the likelihood of suppressing normal myocardium it will also increase. Um, that's a very useful point, I think, too, for these cases. From Dr. Travin, our director of nuclear cardiology here, does assessing FDG uptake heterogeneity help? A paper from Cleveland Clinic from Roy Hachamovit, a study came out a few, a few years ago saying that and he also asks, what about myocardial blood flow assessment from Hopkins data? Hello, Dr. Evan. Um, um, so, you know, uh, great questions. The first question was about FDG heterogeneity. Is that right? Yes, correct. So, so I, um, I find really hard uh, to use that inf uh, information clinically because when you actually compare continuous variables, you know, because that's what they did, continuous, basically looking at the standard deviation of FDG. How do you actually implement clinically? Um, so it's, it's not really practical. It's not a real practical uh, approach uh, because uh, we have to separate the research from, from the clinic. And, and obviously we, we present research trying to um, improve uh, patient care. Um, and, and, and it's very likely that patients with inflammation have higher heterogeneity in FDG optic than patients with physiologic optic. But how do you use, use that information clinically is impossible. So, 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 so it's not practical. Uh, the second, second question was about myocardial blood flow. So we don't do a stress testing. Uh, and so the Hopkins paper actually, um, uh, Tom Schindler, he actually looked at myocardial blood flow during the stress. Um, and, and basically he was just showing the association between inflammation and myocardial uh, blood flow that the segments with, or the patients with inflammation, they have lower myocardial blood flow during the stress. And again, it's an association, but th that's something that you can't really use clinically. So it's just showing you that uh, my, uh, inflammation is associated with microvascular dysfunction. Thank you very much. Yogita, do you wanna ask a question? Uh, Yogita, our specialist in cardiac sarcoidosis from heart failure. Yeah, thank you, uh, Faka. That was a great talk. You really hit all the important key issues uh, and, you know, great summary of the advanced imaging techniques that, you know, we are trying to use and protocolize here. I did have a question about um, quantifying the FDG uptake. So do you use that uh, in, you know, to help your clinicians guide treatment? Do you uh, use an ob objective measure for that? Do you give them information in the form of the... 
standard no. of take value and do you have cutoffs or we we don't we don't use and again there are research suggesting that you should use uh, quantification, um, um, I, 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 I acknowledge that uh, there is research. The issue is that you can't really use SUV to as differentiate inflammation from, from normal physiologic FDG-aptic. Physiologic FDG aptic can have SUV. SUV is the marker that we use for quantification purposes. SUV in physiologic aptic can be as high as inflammation, sometimes even higher. Um, and so, 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 and you know, obviously, if you quantify, you're going to have a trend, and 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 I'm sure um, you can actually uh, um, assess treatment response probably even better than doing just a visual qualitative assessment. But at the, at the moment, we we don't do. Uh, clinically or routinely uh, quantitative assessment of, of FDG uptake and myocardium, but I'm not saying that that's not uh, the right thing to do. Yeah, I think that's one of the appealings of a parametric mapping, right? To have a, but then you need to have very precise data in order Correct. to track. Correct. Okay. If we know that we're imaging inflammation, I think it would be easier. The problem with FDG is that it, it, we don't always know what we're imaging. Yeah. Very good point. There, there, a question from an anonymous attendee is isolated papillary muscle uptake more likely to be pathologic or physiologic? Physiologic. Physiologic. Uh, from Bikram Ramanandam, one of our imaging cardiologists, similar to the T1 mapping question, as T2 mapping techniques continue to improve, such as motion correction, whole heart techniques, uh, and we rely on it for myocarditis as a diagnostic criteria. Do you anticipate that it will be helpful for early sarcoidosis in the future, uh, or do you feel that the technique still remains unreliable? Oh, I think um, as technology improves, uh, T2 mapping may become more and more uh, helpful uh, to combine with LG. Um, T the problem um, is that T2 um, is more related to myocardial edema, to um, and the inflammation uh, related to sarcoidosis is not necessarily acute. Many of these patients have chronic inflammation. And so um, I think if you see T2 enhancement, um, it's most likely related to inflammation, but if it's negative, we see a lot of cases that you still see inflammation on PET. So, so I think it's probably a little, it's probably T T2 mapping is, is probably uh, is more specific than sensitive marker. And the other issue is that T2, you know, once they get an ICV, you're not gonna use T2. Uh, you're not gonna re-image these patients with MRI. So you're not gonna be able to use those markers for follow-up. That's a very, very good point, yeah. Uh, I think uh, one, one more question. Uh, so how do you decide which patients you treat medically? I mean, do, is there a cutoff for inflammation or? Because we're trying to decrease inflammation, LG doesn't change, right? And the, the risk of PT, you said we'll treat it with an ICD. So, uh, wh when do you decide to treat these patients? With uh, immunosuppressants. So, so um, mo um, at Penn, um, patients with cardiac sarcoidosis with LV systolic dysfunction, um, um, AV block, and, and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, receive treatment. Um, patients with, with, without any obvious symptoms that they were diagnosed incidentally because it happens. Um, and if, if they have a lot of LG and they get an ICV uh, for primary prevention, but there's no other, there are no active issues, they may be observed. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's always challenging, right? To decide also if we're going to be screening patients that have extra cardiac sarcoid, as you said, it you think most patients should be screened. The question is what we do with the findings. I think we need more data, right? Asymptomatic patients with cardiac findings on imaging. I agree. All right, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk and we'll stay in touch. Hopefully can create some standardization across institutions to get some more data. Yes, absolutely. So I'm, I'm always available by email. If there are any questions following up this, this, this lecture, okay? okay. Thank you.